Here we are at Queen's University Belfast, January 1984. We're going to discuss the question of integration in geography. Integration is a word with many meanings, but today we hope to get around the question of a field which has witnessed a tremendous amount of specialization in the last 25 years. And we wonder about the possibility of communication among people, for example, in the physical branches of the field with those in the human branches of the field. Today, we're going to hear from some colleagues at Queen's who will speak not only from their own experiences, but also from some deeply felt opinions on the question of integration or specialization in the field. The debate itself is designed as a catalyst of further discussion internationally. So without further ado, let me ask uh, you each to introduce yourselves and something of your background. Mr. Kirk. Uh, Mr. Kirk, um, native of County Durham in uh, England, a graduate of the Joint School of Geography between King's College London and London School of Economics, war service in uh, South and Southeast Asia, and then when I came back from the war, uh, a period training as a teacher at the Institute of Education in London, and then a succession of geography departments, Manchester, Aberdeen, Leicester, and then I came over to be head of department here in 1969. Fine. Fred? Uh, Fred Bowl. I'm a, a native of this part of the world. I um, had my undergraduate training here at Queen's University, uh, and then I went over and I've spent five to six years in North America, first of all doing a doctorate at the University of Michigan, and then um, coming back to Belfast in, oh, now about 20 years ago, and since then I've uh, been teaching in the geography department here in, in Belfast, and with particular interest in what I call urban social geography. Very good, and? Brian Worley, I was born in Manchester in England and I got my first degree from University of Leicester and then went to University of Cambridge where I got my PhD mainly on field work in Switzerland in mountain and glacial geomorphology. I then subsequently had a year at ETH in, in Zurich and then temporary post at Reading and I came here about 10 years ago. My main interest is in mountain and glacial geomorphology though I have special interest in the application of materials properties, materials science to geomorphological problems. Well, we, so we have a wide range of international experience as well as a wide range of professional expertise within geography. Now let me, over to you, how do you perceive this question of integration in the field? Well, I think this is a, a topic, of course, which is uh, very current at the moment in most departments of geography. Uh, I think it is partly to do with the expansion of geography departments and academic geography. It's also something to do, I think, with the tremendous uh, diversification of the subject, certainly over the last 20 or 30 years. And I think when, when students come into the subject at the higher education level from school geography, I think the thing which they notice in particular is the way in which most of the members of staff seem to have their own particular specialism and they're working as it were on the frontiers of the subject very frequently with an interface with other disciplines and uh, very often at the end of the first year uh, students come along and say well now what is this subject we are having uh, you know certain ideas from Mr. X and other ideas from Dr. Y uh, they seem to be interested across into uh, soil science into soil chemistry and here's somebody else who is sort of historical geography with an interest in archaeology. Uh, where is the center? Is there, are there any central issues? Where are the central problems of geography? And I think this is one of the, the great uh, problems which we face now. That the, the expansion, both philosophically and in terms of numbers of people involved, a number of specialist magazines and journals which come out in geography, an enormous field. And now the question, I think, which we all ask, is how do we come back into some kind of central position? Are there any central problems? Or is it a hollow 
is there a hollow core and all the effort is going on on the periphery. Now, I, I think one of the major divisions is between the physical geography approach on the one hand and what can be decided as the human geography approach on the other. And within uh, our own particular department, these two sides uh, balance reasonably well in terms of the activities which we uh, undertake. And uh, Brian Wally here is one of the active members in the, on the physical side, and Fred Bowl is <coughs> one of the active members on the human side. Um, now, at times, when we do discuss and places in the timetable and uh, research monies and so on, very often these two seem to be uh, opposing each other. But I know that Brian has ideas about the, uh, the laws, if you like, or the, the objectives of uh, physical geography, which I'm sure he'd, he'd, you know, mm -hmm. he'd come in on. Uh, well, there is also always a problem here, and so far as that geomorphology in British universities has tended to be the predominant aspect of, of physical geography. And uh, I inevitably talk as a geomorphologist, but at times I would also perhaps put on a, a hat for my fellow climatologists, soil scientists and so on. Um, on the other hand, as geomorphology has tended to be the big aspect of physical geography, uh, there is a problem here too in terms of resources and teaching and how much should be devoted to particular aspects of it, which we'll no doubt be discussing later on. Um, as far as I see one of the major problems is of how much should an undergraduate be taught, which is one problem, uh, and how much should the research aspect of a department be something which is over and above the um, just straight taught pedagogic aspect of, of, of geography, because I see there's a widespread here um, between what one teaches and what one researches in. Uh, there is probably a, a general core of physical geography in all its aspects that most people would accept as part of a general university course, at least within the United Kingdom. But when it comes to adding research onto that, where does research in geography or research in ge geomorphology fit into that, then we do see a very widespread, uh, and I see that there is almost a paradox here between what we should be teaching as geography and geomorphology, uh, and there probably is a core there, but certainly when it comes to issues of resources, but obviously money, and uh, how much research effort should be put in particular directions, uh, then there are all sorts of problems arising uh, because of the way in which geomorphology has gone, in particular over the, the last 10, 20 years, because as it's tended to become, if you like, more scientific, scientific perhaps in, in quotes there, rather than uh, anything which gone on previously it hasn't been scientific, but it has demanded more resources to keep up with developments in the other aspects, in uh, other aspects of material science, soil chemistry, um, of field equipment, all sorts of things which cost quite a lot of money. And uh, that, I think, is, is one big problem, the disparity almost between the research frontier and, and what should be taught as a general core of teaching. And in particular, that's also true of schools, because as people have asked, well, how do we bring geomorphology up to date what should be an A-level syllabus, for instance, what should be taught at uh, A-level geography, where people have perhaps gone into geography at school level wanting maybe as something which they, uh, they know they can do, something which perhaps they prefer to a hard science, physics, chemistry, biology, and even at A-level they may be confronted with aspects of geomorphology in A-level syllabuses, which are really quite alien to them and not they weren't expecting at all. And I think that certainly arises often with undergraduates that we take into our department and I suspect other departments as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think there are some stresses that I mean that come out. They are expressed in terms of this sort of resource conflict, you know, when you're saying that since geomorphology is becoming more expensive and some of the rest of us might think this is a huge sort of cuckoo in the nest, you see, this is consuming our resources. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think the development in, in certain aspects of human geography have their own rather heavy and much greater resource demand than they used to with large-scale surveys and yes. so on, which in yeah. fact is not hardware, but it's, it's a sort of, if you like, sort of software. And uh, I think, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, I could recognize why geomorphology or other aspects of physical geography should because it wants to push into the the edges of the subject to, to make breakthroughs to improve understanding that these 
sort of things are undertaken. Uh, and the same thing, I think we feel the same on the human geography end, that the, the, the needs are enormous because the problems that we're trying to look at are both very large in, in a sort of academic sense and also in terms of trying to make some contribution to resolving sort of practical problems out there. So that the, uh, it seems like there's, the, there's a, I, I sense a, a considerable sort of tension or potential tension with, within the subject. I think we, uh, I mean, I think I would feel, for instance, that um, there's so much to be known or tried to understood by students on the dimensions of the human geography and, and the links into the social sciences, sociology and economics and psychology and political science and so on, that really, in one sense, I might feel that the time that they may spend in our undergraduate course doing physical geography is uh, diversionary, that in fact they should be uh, in fact, spending the time doing work out in other social sciences and doing human geography with us. And the reverse is also yeah. true, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But the problem is, of course, we've only got a limited time, three years, four years, in which to produce graduates uh, in, in geography. And I think that most uh, curricula throughout the UK, in most geography departments, you really do start with a sort of first year in which you're allowing the geographers to begin to sample geography at higher education level and then uh, almost without exception you begin to get then sort of elements of specialization creeping in they're given options and so they begin to opt for more on the physical side or more on the human side so by the time they come to take their first degree there are usually either committed human geographers and a whole variety of these or committed physical geographers now, those people that go on then do research clearly choose the problems which lie in the fields that they're interested in. And then those that go on to teach and come back into universities have already got a specialism very clearly demonstrated. And so when they come back in for the more further teaching, then, of course, they tend to be allocated that area. And so the specialism goes on. And as the, as the numbers in departments increase, so you get your specialist in historical geography, in economic geography, agricultural geography, urban geography, social the whole thing, you see. You begin to get a whole lot of specialists operating on the student <coughs> body. Now, the thing, that the thing that worries me is that at times, in order to become competent on a particular frontier of the subject, you really have to begin to learn the language of the other side of the, the interface. I think if you're becoming a social geographer, it behoves you to begin to know what the problems are in sociology or some of the other social sciences. Uh, the difficulty then arrives when you become so competent in the other side of the so-called dividing line that you begin then to begin to be interested in other men's problems as well as their language. And the danger then starts to grow when an individual who has crossed over, sampled the language, begins to solve those other people's problems and then tries to maintain that that is still geography. Uh -huh. uh, the, 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 the general hope, of course, would be individuals that go there, sample this, get well known and respected in the other districts, and then come back in to geography. Now the problem is, when they do come back in, if they come back in, then they should be able to contribute to something of the, the core disciplines. Now, you see, in some cases in physical geography, uh, right, I get the impression, well, let, let's take some of your own interests in uh, uh, electron microscopic uh, work, and processes of weathering and so on. Now, when you're into that field, you're really contributing to a knowledge in geology and chemical processes, physical processes and so on, operating on physical laws. Now, where do you see, having got that expertise as a geomorphologist working on that very fascinating interface, where do you see the sort of contributing back into the, the subject itself, into geography itself? Well, that, that, that assumes that <laughs> geomorphology 
is actually part of right. geography. Uh, and from this point of view, it is, I suppose, slightly anomalous because in, uh, in the States, for instance, uh, most geomorphology is studied as part of a geology program anyway. And, and from that point of view, it, it does have um, peculiar differences compared with the UK. Um, but to answer your question, um, I am trying to look at particular problems, if you like, that interest me. Right. And uh, to a certain extent, that's a sufficient justification for doing what I do in the way that I, I do it. Whether my peers agree with that is, in a sense, uh, slightly different, whether the work right. is good or not. Right. But uh, in terms of bringing it back into, into geography, um, I think it does tend to filter back, because inevitably ideas of explaining the landscape, if we take that sort of basis yeah. of what geomorphology is at a teaching level, at school or at university, to try and give some idea about how the landscape arrived as what it is. Uh, in general, historical terms, uh, which necessarily incorporate some geology, uh, in terms of, of processes, for want of a better word, of saying what ultimately goes on in the landscape. Uh, things do feed back because changes in perspective do occur. For instance, uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, middle 1960s, uh, denudation chronology w w was all the rage, but I think geomorphologists uh, really came to a full stop because after having made certain descriptions and subsequently um, what one might call quantitative descriptions of the landscape or of different landforms, uh, there was quite definitely a sitting back in armchairs and saying, so what? Mm -hmm. uh, now, paradoxically, we're coming back into that because after having said something about how the landscape is produced, not perhaps all that well in some cases, but I think we know a little bit more about the sort of things that go on in the landscape now, um, people are starting to make moves back into what one might call large-scale geomorphology to come back to the Lester King approach of, of looking at erosion surfaces, uh, not just describing what they are, but to try and put them in a, uh, a temporal perspective. And linking up, and I think this is actually quite important, with what we now know about plate tectonics and the integrating factors in geology, and, and that is one way in which large-scale geomorphology does actually play back in directly into, into geology. It's not just a, a study of processes, sedimentology yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So th th there is some sort of bringing back into the, the broader aspects of explaining landforms um, at that broad large-scale level, but also, I think, at the, at the micro level as well. If we take students out into the field, we want to explain something about the hydrological cycle, and I, I think that most people would agree that ought to be something that should be taught in geomorphology, uh, because it also incorporates aspects of vegetation, of, of climate, and, and obviously has very considerable human implications as well. Yeah. So that if you're in the field, you can say something about what is going on with respect to a particular drainage basin. And the process studies would say something about transport of debris, about deposition and so on. Now, that may not be at a very high level of explanation with respect to the research frontier, but nevertheless is a lot more uh, use, I think, to explaining what is going on so that people can comprehend those sorts of problems uh, from the broad geographical aspect. What One example, uh, silting up of, of lakes and rivers, um, straight hydrological perhaps, but where one is considering whether one builds a dam in an area, how rapidly is it going to silt up? Is it actually worthwhile putting in vast sums of money for a, a dam construction project, perhaps in a um, third world country? Is it actually worthwhile doing that when the lifetime of the dam may be only a matter of 10, perhaps 20 years, because at that stage it will silt up? The sort of studies which will tell you how rapidly it's going to silt up, uh, perhaps the estimates that have been done previously, it's usually the case, are an underestimate of how rapidly it will do so. That's the sort of thing that hydrological studies will tell you and have a direct payoff in terms of social consequences and come right. back into right. wider mm -hmm. geographical applications. I'm so concerned way, about this, this sort of, uh, I mean, you were talking about this yeah. kind of, there was this image of the hole in right. the middle, right. and then there was, everybody was going off around the edge, and then we're maybe sort of, con maybe there's a concern develops about uh, this whole, so uh, you know, each of us saying, "Well, we're we're out there, but uh, you know, there are pieces of our thing really that have, are of some relevance to this." Well, so I'm recalling just when you were mentioning that, that I remember at least 20 years ago, uh, the image of the American city was that it was a donut, 
and that was there was a hole in the middle, and all right. the dough was round the outside. Now I wonder, you know, is there almost a, a sense? I mean, first instance, in a in a personal reward sense within geography as it, as we know it, that the rewards, in fact, of achievement and recognition and stuff, by and large, have been around the edge. Mm. Uh, and uh, you know, what 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 I, I, I'm not clear. You see what this what this middle is. I mean, is it a hole or is it something yeah. that, in fact, is a major well, well, entity? Take, take your own. Uh, Annie Fred, uh, interested in um, urban morphology originally, I remember, and then becoming more interested in the, the social problems mm -hmm. and social geography of the cities, as it were, and so on. Now, clearly, you come into contact with, uh, with planners, with sociologists, with various other disciplines, and in order to converse with them, you've got to know their language, the sort of things that they're interested in, now, the, my question again is, having got all that knowledge and experience, then how do you see your own particular area, your study of cities and so on, feeding back in to a centre, if there is a centre? Now, yeah, one, one is thing, assuming yeah. that there is a centre, but there may not be. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a geographical sense to me in the sense that, uh, that I would be looking at what I'd call the sort of spatial dimension of all these different things, which is the pattern and the organisation and the interaction over space. Now, that, that, that is, a, what is, is my geographical core, you see, which helps me to, to when I'm out there with the sociologist, I'm, I'm sorting, I'm selecting, and I'm bringing this in. But, but the part that then I have trouble is that if there's a sort of almost like a human geography core, right. uh, is is this part of a bigger core, or are there two separate? If I mean, with Brian's case, maybe he sees a sort of an area where uh, aspects of physical geography are focusing inward on something that's quite clearly perceived as geographic. But do these two human and physical geographical cores in turn integrate, or are they all sort of sitting still? We're watching each other saying, well, he got £10,000 last year and we got only nine, you know, or right. uh, are they right. getting so many students and all this sort of... Uh, I don't think these are important arguments, but they're symbolic, perhaps. That's right, or the value set. Is this relevant or isn't it relevant to the problems of modern society? Yeah. You know? uh, I think this is, this is a, a kind of question uh, that is, that, that's frequently asked. Now, I for one think there is a common core, a unified structure within, within geography, but the problem always has been on what basis do you f define that core? Now, you can say, well, all right, you can define it in terms of the object of study. And uh, after all, most disciplines in the 19th century came into being and were allocated in a division of labor, certain chunks of the world around them, which they began to study in great, uh, great depth. Um, Geography, as I see it, was not allocated precisely a chunk of reality which was their exclusive rights. Now, the nearest approach, I think, and uh, one gets it coming from both sides, is that in some way we are studying the skin of the earth, uh, we are studying landscape. Now, my problem then, uh, some years ago, and still is to some extent a problem, is if you say the geography is defined by landscape, then you immediately get those say, ah, but I'm only interested in the human cultural aspects of landscape. And then the physical geography, ah, oh, well, I'm only interested in hydrology of river basins, or whatever, you see. Uh, and one says, is there a whole, a landscape, which can draw people in from all over the, the subject into a study? So that's one problem. Is there a central object? Second is, can we define it in terms of methodology? You know, geography is about maps and history about chaps and so on. Are we in fact studying a, are we, do we share a common methodology? Spatial geometry, the analysis of spatial geometry, which in a sense was behind a lot of the quantification movement in the 60s. Or, uh, if you can't get it on object, you can't get it on a common technology or methodology, where do you go from there? And uh, many years ago, I committed myself to saying that it is problem orientated. And then, of course, the trouble is that you say, well, what sort of problems? You know, there are problems in human geography, and there are problems in physical geography. 
Uh, and this is, a, in fact, as you, as you know, where I, a long time ago, got interested in some sort of model, some sort of structure, where you could bring uh, the outside world, the mental world of perception, together into a unified structure, uh, which I call the phenomenal environment of the one, the world outside, and the behavioral environment, the world from looking from inside. Now, my phenomenal environment, and uh, you know, one gets comments from both sides, the phenomenal environment was not only the world of nature, it was also all the works of man, which were also on the face of the earth. So in a sense, once man had created that or structured that, then geographers, whether it's a bit which has been built by man, a bit built by nature, it's all one phenomenal environment, which, is, uh, which it can be exposed to geographical techniques. Now, I don't know how far you know, my colleagues would, would, would go along. So, so you're pumping for techniques as being an integrating thing now? No, Rather I'm saying that there is, uh, that one of the things is that outside there, the world outside, the world of reality, instead of dividing it into the world of nature and the world of man and so on, you can say the works of man now are very evident on the face of the earth. Why not be able to write a geomorphology of the urban landscape of uh, Belfast as much as a geomorphology of the Congo Basin. That, that, that's fair enough, but right. it, uh, I don't think it goes actually very far well, all right. insofar as I wouldn't really dispute what you, you say um, if it remains within what we teach at an undergraduate level, because that in a sense is not going to change very much. Since geomorphology um, for straight historical accidental reasons got pushed into geography departments or, or sloughed off from geology departments, whichever way you put it, but undoubtedly the, the first uh, uh, British geomorphologists were also geologists, or perhaps I yeah. ought to say the, 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 the geologists who founded geology were not only stratigraphers in the first sense uh, and mineralogists, but, but geomorphologists, and, right. and we've now separated off. And you could say that there are certain geomorphological techniques which are, are not geological, but I think that most geomorphologists would tend to plump for geological ways of thinking rather than for sociological uh, or, or anything on, on the social sciences, and that, and that, in a sense, is where the split is. That's perfectly true at a research level. It's also true with obvious um, discrepancies between how we teach things and how much time we devote within courses at school or, or at university. Um, though, I think in terms of describing the landscape, you, you can have some sort of core, but as soon as you want to describe the minutiae, whether that happens to be from what F Fred sees as important in his view of the world, or what I see, perhaps down an electron microscope, I'm so far removed both from his vocabulary and indeed from the, from the vocabulary of the people that I teach, that, that it is almost a separate problem. Yeah, but aren't there problems in common in the sense that we talk about, let's say, urban heat islands as a particular form of microclimate as a result of the climate of, of, of cities, wind eddying and all the rest of it. Uh, there are already people in our department, uh, some of your own postgraduate students, who have uh, uh, been studying weathering of buildings. Now, are we talking about the erosion, the erosion of a man-built path oh, well, of the phenomenal environment? Th that, that, that's true, but, but, but if somebody said um, and indeed, as they have done, why are we getting um, erosion of this particular building stone? Why, right. why is it breaking down? Right. Um, they happen to come to us. Uh, they might go to one of my colleagues and say, what's happening to the, the urban heat island? But they could always quite happily go to a physicist or somebody in the meteorology department. Yeah. For instance, most meteorology uh, is really physics. It's, it's not geography. And most of what comes under meteorology and geography departments is really climatology. It is the geographical aspects. It's not the hard, nitty-gritty of predicting the weather and explaining what goes on in the environment, just in the same way as saying, oh, yeah, there's some uh, decay on this particular building. You could ha quite happily go to, to a chemist or a geologist, as indeed people do, to explain some of those particular things. It just so happens that our research interest is in that particular field. So it, it, the, the division, the split, is, is actually at the research level rather than at what we, what we teach. We might teach a little bit about uh, decay of building stone in one of the 
higher level courses that, that we teach, but, but it's certainly not going to be a fundamental part of it. Now sometimes I think we, we, we're you know, perhaps so concerned about trying to find these common things that we're, mm. we're sort of grasping around and say, oh yes, yes, you know, Brian looks at, at the erosion of the stone of the building and I worry about the speculative uh, group who, who built the thing in the first place and somehow then we're both, you know, the, we, we come together, but the, 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 the nature of the underlying processes I think we're talking about are, are yeah. so profoundly mm. different uh, and we're you know we're, we're in that sense or unless we argue that in fact there's you know, there's, are we talking about sort of processes in the physical and biological world which are to be distinctive from processes in the in the social world except for maybe like we talk about analogies about uh, man having territorial behavior and we look we see it's common ground with the zoologists yeah. maybe or yeah. the, the sociologists talk about stratification and somebody says ah you know yeah. These but, are but so sort of yeah. superficial, but you know, they're not, they're not... Does the very fact that, all right, you go, uh, that Brian, let's say, goes back to physical and chemical laws, or whatever whatever these are, theory, uh, the rest of it, and uh, of course some people, I think, wouldn't it, rather than to argue that the whole of the, the world disciplines was in fact, uh, there are only two, uh, physics and post -stamp, postage stamp collecting. Mm, uh, yes, yes. I think this was there. There was the contrast, wasn't it? In other words, that you go back to physical laws and so on, and that you go back to social theory or the laws of human behaviour. Let's put it this way: it's some kind of laws and theories of human behaviour. So that you're going back, or you're you're adding to theory outside. But I'd still ask, given the fact that you're applying those different theories, those different philosophies, the different. The, is there a common meeting ground where you can say, ah, he is now looking at a geographical problem, or he is looking at a geographical problem. He's not trying to pro solve problems for the chemists or the physicists or the geologists. Mm -hmm. And where, where do you get this, this common core? You say, um, having established the phenomenal environment, I then went on to say that all right, uh, one is concerned with different kinds of spatial behavior. Now, where spatial behavior has a perception or cognition or purpose or consciousness, then the way in which you see the environment or perceive or sense the environment has an influence on how you behave. That doesn't mean to say there isn't direct contact between the world outside and you as a physical human being. You know, if you uh, are walking along a dark street and there's a manhole cover up and you fall in, whether you perceive it or not, you behave in a certain fashion. So there is a, a, a link in that way, physically. But I uh, developed the idea that there would be, in fact, also a different kind of environment, a behavioral environment in which the attitudes and cultural levels and perceptions and cognition influence the way you perceive that environment, and that certain kinds of spatial behavior of man were influenced by the behavioral environment, and was then expressed in the world outside in the phenomenal environment. Now, in discussions that we've had previously, and, I, and, and we've had debates on this clearly with you in the department, what I've been, uh, I, I think one can establish that in the level of conscious, purposeful human behavior. And this is clearly very important in the area of human geography and decision making, the problems involved in spatial behavior. Now, if you say it's a behavioral science, then you get a, di they get a second level, which if you, if you like is, is, is the, the behavior of animals and plants the instinctive kind of adaptation. But then you go down that, below that again, and you get into an unconscious world where behavior is taking place without purpose, apparently, without instinct, but obeying certain major general forces. Now, what I'm saying is, uh, is there this great spectrum or range of behavior? And you start with certain problems of a geographical, environmental kind, of a human conscious kind at the top, and you have at the other end of the spectrum the behavior 
of certain physical forces and physical materials of a purely unconscious fire. In other words, are you not, in working out a, a river basin, the mechanics, really talking about the behavior of a raindrop? Well, <laughs> yes, uh, that is true. But how much you want to know about that behavior of a raindrop or an eroding soil particle right. to explain things within the behavioral environment as a geographical entity, I think is, is fairly slight. Yeah. You don't need to know very yeah. much about <coughs> it. Okay. Uh, and so the basic physical geography, which would include geomorphology, study of soil, pedology, um, climatology, and so on, is a relatively thin layer, to use your sort of stratigraphic mm. analogy, uh, a relatively thin layer upon which human beings and animals and plants behave. Okay. And that I would agree, provide some sort of core for geographical understanding. Uh, but when you go, go beyond that rather thin layer to say exactly what is going on from the point of view either of pure research or because somebody wants to know about it, even from the point of view of saying something quite specifically about soil erosion, it doesn't really end up as a geographical problem. It could be a problem in, uh, in agricultural engineering, a problem in hydrology, a problem in straight academic geomorphology, and therefore tackleable from all other different points of view. In, indeed, um, from, from stochastic processes, it could be looked at uh, as indeed uh, Ted Culling has done. From a straight mathematical, physical point of view, and, and, and Ted Culling, I think, got a bit of a, a rough deal because he in a very perceptive paper, something like 15 or more years ago, looked at the stochastics of, of movement of particles on hill slopes. And people said, essentially, this, this wasn't geography. In a sense, they were right. It isn't geography. It was a problem. Right. Uh, and therefore, perfectly tackled well, I mean, in the way I, mean, that I, I, I also, I think, recognise that there are these common areas where, I'd like to say, some kind of a land use problem, which would be the, the nature of the, the, the physical materials and their behavior and mm. the vegetation patterns and so on and then, and then human perception and their reaction to that and, and so on and that forms the totality. I think there is the possibility for things like that. What strikes me, uh, maybe just my perception of things at the moment, is that uh, there's really very little work actually done in geography in this area that is supposed to be the core. That In fact, we are uh, around the edge and uh, we either uh, I mean, the question is: Do we is, is it, uh, do we need to make more effort to 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 build this core if if it is there? Mm. And, uh, I mean, there's two two possible reasons for that. One might be because it is a genuine thing that should be looked at, and then I think well, we must admit to ourselves also there's also the aspect of our concern as people who are <laughs> gain our livelihood in the discipline that we want to. You know, if we if we let things run too freely, we may we may literally be concerned about not just the nice academic matters, about, mm. but about the existence mm. of the subject itself. Mm. I think there's a potential core. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to pounce in here in, in sort of by way of summing up what I've heard so far. You've, the question of a core within geography is presumably based on method or object or problem. And I have heard you discuss it in intellectual terms, in logical terms, but let me put now the devil's advocate position, i.e. that geography is a, an accident of institutional history, that it is uh, defined for administrative convenience rather than on intellectually defensible grounds. Um, to what extent are your different views of integration related to positions of responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the identity of the discipline in a particular set of institutions. Yes, well, uh, you, you see, as head of department, yes. I have to go to Senate or Academic Council and defend or support a position for geography in the disciplines which are taught in the faculties in the university. Um, and one always finds oneself in this situation of some person in an adjacent discipline. Let's say, if I try to say something, no, we do this in geography, or uh, geology, or we do this in botany, or we do this in uh, physics, you see, or whatever it is. And my problem is, from my own philosophy, which has grown up uh, over, over my career in different kinds of institutions, to say that there are certain areas 
in which the geographer has the necessary skills, he's got the techniques, he's got the experience of looking at particular problems in a way in which many of the adjacent discipline followers do not have. They are, the, if you like, the ult looking at from a ge geography point of view, they're the ultra-specialists on the end of certain radii that come from the center. Now, I may be helped in this way because I have a foot in both camps. Uh, I've researched and studied on in geomorphology and quaternary studies on the one hand and uh, uh, over on the perception studies and uh, on, the, on the human geography side. So I see both, but the way in which I've always saw it is that if one is talking about decision making of different kinds and certain kinds of spatial behavior, in order to understand those, there are a, a number of things which you have to do. It's no good looking at the outside world as it is at the moment and try to explain past decisions in terms of that environment. So the first thing is, you must have techniques in geography to recreate the world as it was at the time of the event or situation in which we're discussing. And so I'm interested in polyanalytical techniques, geochronological techniques, the quaternary studies, to try and get the, the, the geochronology of those sorts of patterns of decisions and behavior. I would say then, you have to be able to reconstruct the world as it, as it was thought to be by the people involved in that perception or cognition. And then you have to trace the impact of those decisions on the external world. So there's, there's a sort of coming and flowing, a stimulus and response, which may start in the physical world and end up in the mental world. And so I find personally no difficulty mm -hmm. in bringing them together. But I know that, you know, yes. this is not, not shared mm -hmm. by everybody. I mean, there was implicit in your in your comp. Maybe was it at least, as you said, devil's advo advocate that you know was it, was it pragmatism? Just that that it's, we, we'd better we better stick together, or we'll, we'll you know s swim together, or, or or sink together, kind There's of thing. Element of that, and and that would be interesting if, in fact, instead of Brian and I sitting on either side of Professor Kirk, but we uh, <laughs> at least for short term undertook his role, whether we would what our perception, in fact, would be. I, th mm. I mean, I personally, I think my, my perception is seen very much from my corner at the moment because of that's where I feel, I mean, where I'm working and where I, there's all these important issues to be raised. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe I can afford to do that, maybe because, uh, well, there is actually somebody else In who will, will try to hold the, the middle ground together yes. and I can afford the luxury, perhaps, of uh, being where I like to be at the moment. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that there is need for a certain critical mass, as it were, of variety oh, yes. in both yeah, sides yeah, before yeah. you can afford yeah. specialization. Sure. But I see a certain responsibility in your, uh, in your statements about core and geography, mm. which uh, you, neither of you feel responsible about. You do a good job as a geomorphologist. Well, I, 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 I take yes. your point that you made as devil's advocate, that there are historical accidents which present geography as it, as it is. And undoubtedly that's true, especially with respect to ge geomorphology. <coughs> um, on the other hand, uh, in terms of the um, uh, most cynical level of, of where I get my bread and butter from, uh, yes, there is a responsibility. But, but that aside, I, I think, um, to follow on from Professor Kirk's argument, there is something which one can call loosely in some people's cases, more strongly in others, uh, a geographical study area. But I think that study area is essentially one of uh, non-research aspect of it. In other words, ba basic teaching about the physical and human environment. And it obviously impinges on certain areas, um, just as there tend to be cores in other things. But I suspect um, physicists may have similar um, lines of argument too. Where does um, particular type, say, cosmology interface with, uh, mm -hmm. with, with quantum physics and that sort of thing? I, I know in particular in physical chemistry, and when you look at the research, <coughs> The, the, the problems, the, the disparities, are come always at the research frontiers. But if you look at where the good research is going on in other sciences, it's 
quite frequently where a physicist, a molecular biologist, a mathematician and a computer expert get together to solve particular problems. And, and that's why from my point of view, in terms of the things that I'm interested in the research level, it, it's the problems that, that count. And if I don't know something about a particular bit of physics, then I, I, I'll go cap in hand to a physicist friend and ask him yeah, if But it's a bit worrying, what, you know, as, as I understood what you said there, that the, in the sense the, the integration of where the wider field of geography is, is only teaching. You know, that, that there's that, nothing that we can think. actually get together on um, at a research level. Unless it is a particular problem. Otherwise, it seems to me the teaching must be very sort of low key kind of thing or something. Oh, well, not necessarily low key. Uh, and obviously, there will be, be updating of those things as, as new ideas take precedence. But there can be problems, but it's the sort of problem that for some reason perhaps we might collaborate on. Or, uh, for instance, uh, if we're looking at the weathering or the erosion and, and decay of, of some particular building, mm. I could either put on a, a quasi historical geographer's hat and go and start rummaging around in archives saying, when was this building built, where did the stone come from, the things that I need to know to answer that problem. Or I could ask one of my colleagues in the department who say, ah oh, yes, well, this is where you need to go for the answer. Mm. Now that doesn't make me a historical geographer, it makes a certain amount of connection between different aspects of the discipline mm. to solve that particular problem. On the other hand, it could be that the person who knows best is in architecture, or it may be that somebody in molecular physics just happens to be interested in the buildings of Belfast. Mm. I go to somebody who can give me the answer, whether it happens to be within the department or not, uh, may be purely accidental. So I'm, I'm not sure whether we can collaborate in terms of upgrading uh, the, the central core um, other than once in a while to, to bring up our own particular aspects rather than to go out and, and look for um, communality. The only thing aspects. I'd wonder a bit about I mean, is whether, I mean, speaking personally, I mean, it's not about other people, is, is that we, we uh, we don't work maybe hard enough at uh, looking at the core part where there may be. I mean, maybe there are more opportunities, and because yeah, we're so true. busy, yeah. uh, you know, in, on the end, as you say quite rightly, you might go to the architect rather than the historical geographer, yeah. and the, the same thing may yeah. may well apply. But as it, in other words, I think the nature of geography is is uh, um, tendency to go, you know, centrifugal. Let me, lift, you know. let me lift it a bit, a bit become a bit more abstract. In other words, aren't we, in the end, not only talking about different kinds of spatial behavior and the problems of spatial behavior, but aren't we also, from all angles of human and physical and so on, geography, frequently talking about structures, whether it's uh, physical structures or human structures, and we're talking about what is it to uh, hold structures together, uh, what are the systems that are expressed in structural terms, and then very particularly, aren't we all really involved in the problems of structural transformation? The way in which one particular structure will give way to another particular structure. It's the thing that always, always fascinates me. Human beings on the face of the earth have never really created anything basically new. All they've done is restructure. It brought bits and pieces together and made a weapon of various buildings and made a building and so on. They are great, uh, human beings are adepts at, re at restructuring, structuring and restructuring. Our knowledge also is built in the same way. It's structured and we get these shifts of uh, levels of achievement of learning through structural transformation of our, of our knowledge and our outlook. Now, the world around us goes through these periods of structural transformation, whether it's in a macro field or a micro field and so on. And that there in a, is a common concept which has its different sides to it, but uh, is also an area where we can have some common no. Common ground. But isn't that just a sociology of, of science or sociology of sociology or of history or whatever? I mean, it applies everywhere. Well, there, there are certain structural systems which I think are, are, are put forward by Jim Offaltis or put forward by climate. There are certain structural systems of the city which are put forward by sociologists and so on. Now, all right, the content, the elements which are involved may be different. But the, the structure itself, and now we're getting into holism, the structure itself is more than the sum of the parts. And I'm all constantly fascinated by 
what are the things, what, is, what are the forces which lead one structure to change into another structure? Is it, is it some internal force? Is it something that comes in from the outside, which suddenly will lead in a generation or in a matter of five millennia, a, a structural change? And uh, very frequently the problems which we all have in geography do lie in that area. In fact, really, in the first year course that we have at Queen's, we, we try to introduce students to get away from the school geography into rethinking their geographical ideas in terms first of the, the physical systems, then of human systems and their corresponding structures, and then we try, not always successfully, I might say, to try and weave these two together in terms of environmental, environmental constraints or environmental change, climatic change or biographic change, with this bit of historical geography coming in and so on. And we try and find case studies in which natural and human things come together and are locked in systems. And then why these systems do tend to change from time to time. You know? Do the students understand, or do they run to a specialty? Well, I try to put the philosophy in, but my colleagues sometimes say, if I put it at the front beginning of the course, then the students don't know what I'm talking about. You see? Well, and they, they now persuaded me to put it in at the last lectures of the course. And now what I have to do is to review uh, what has gone on in the early parts yeah. and try to pull it together in terms of problems of philosophy. Now, uh, there are there are dangers and weaknesses at, at both at both yeah. ends. Uh, yeah. But Brian's been involved. Well, well Fred until has recently, to, both <laughs> try, uh, uh, both been involved in this this attempt. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a very great problem. It, it's really just one in uh, the perception, mm -hmm. but of the way students come to us and what we are trying to get over from our different viewpoints, even if we want to try and present geography, that it's presented one way at school and modern geography at university tends to be something rather different. Now, of course, that depends rather on what uh, syllabus, and it, uh, unfortunately, it comes down to exams and what they've been, been fed with, rather than the sort of things that which might actually interest people. Uh, but that problem is one which is really quite difficult to, to tackle. I, I look at some ways in which um, aspects of pattern are important, and everything from the structure of a clay mineral uh, to the pattern of field systems, landscapes, at all sorts of level. If you can recognize pattern and spatial distribution, and, and I think the professor would agree with me, that, that this is at least something which is of, of a geographical information, even though the, uh, the, the pattern, the structure of a clay mineral might be quite adequately looked at under uh, chemical aspects in a, in a chemistry mm -hmm. department. But nevertheless, that clay mineral particle has all sorts of other implications with respect to plant growth and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that there are themes that you can bring through, both in terms of the technique, spatial structuring, organisation, pattern recognition and so on, uh, as well as the way in which things are interconnected. And in our courses, I think we do try and interweave these uh, to a mm -hmm. fair extent. And from that point of view, we are trying to put forward something which is an integrated whole as geography, as, yeah. a, as a core. But I, I come back to this point again. Uh -huh. It's something that I think we essentially teach rather mm. than research. Yeah, there's always a danger. I mean, I, again, you know, I'm not sure, but this was, that in fact, it, it all seems a bit contrived. You see, they're all, look at them all. They're all talking about systems because they're desperately trying to put these things together that in fact <laughs> should just go their separate way. But oh no, yeah. <laughs> we've got this marvelous rubric over the top, you see. And the, the, I mean, I've heard comments from students about this that. Uh, that they, they realize what we're trying to do, we're sort of uh, covering the cracks, you see. Mm -hmm. We're That's trying to get, in, in their minds, an integration which are not necessarily there in the minds of their teachers. Yes, yeah. well, you have, to, you have to try and... Uh, <laughs> you have to you, lure them in. There's the damage that we do. All, <laughs> all the minds with stuff coming from different directions, uh -huh. and that after the three or four years, in a magic kind of way, they will integrate and be able to tell us all about what geography mm -hmm. is, you see, in a sense which uh, the individual teachers very frequently find great difficulty, individually, in saying what it is. Uh -huh. 
well, then should one toss the word out of the vocabulary uh, if it's going to be thus uh, evacuated of meaning? Uh, you're saying we preach it, but actually we don't know how to do it ourselves. Well, we well, just I, I do. Yes. <laughs> yes. I may lose my job. Yes. But, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, and for what, 2,000 years, mm. people have known roughly what? what are the central problems mm. in geography. It's not as though we just invented the thing in 1960s. Yes. You know, it's been going for a long time. It has a very respectable area of responsibility in the mm. whole of human knowledge. Mm. And I think it would be a tragedy if all that history and developments and excitement and the areas of research and the expansion which we've got now mm. was suddenly thrown overboard. We have an enormous responsibility to the future. One word from each of you of a positive <laughs> nature to convince <laughs> me that geography should continue its integrative uh, sort of mission. Well, I, I think the obvious one is if the geography department was disbanded, then it would have to be reinvented because there would be a gap. Whether that's historical accident or no, there would necessarily be a gap. Mm. Fine. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there are some really fundamental problems where, in fact, the, the physical and human geography should be applying themselves to. I think I just, I, my concern is just that I don't think we're doing enough of it, but I think those problems are sitting out there very, very important to, to mankind, basically. And uh, they're there to be got at, but our feeling at the moment has been we're not, we're not heading in on those, but we're going out. Well, maybe, as Brian said, uh, that where the big inventions are happening today are at the interface of contrasting fields. Maybe we have in-house sufficient contrast now, after mm -hmm. our era of specialization, right. that some creative mm -hmm. uh, breakthrough will happen. I want to thank you so very much. Our time is up. Uh, thank you so very much for expressing your opinions and your experiences today. And we'll be sure to let you know what the response will be to this debate. Right. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you.